now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. We're having a joyful old time here. A happy time. We are. A very uplifting time. I come up with just a shorter way to say it. Just a, It should be a word that describes that kind of feeling, that kind of attitude. We'll think of it later. Let's move on. It's 7.07 <laughs> now on O'Connor and Company coming up later this morning at 8.35. Chuck Thies, he's a D.C. political an- analyst, and he is, uh, well, he's going to give us his commentary on Mayor Bowser's track record here now that he's she signed her deal with Ted Leonsis on the... Uh, Wizards and the Capitals. I'm Larry O'Connor alongside Julie Gunlock. Good morning. Good morning to you. Joining us right now, Neil Parrott. Neil Parrott is uh, throwing his hat back into the ring there as a candidate, or wants to be the candidate, the Republican nominee, I should say, for the 6th Congressional District, a uh, title that he held two years ago in that very same district. He joins us now. This time, though, Neil Parrott, it will be an open seat. You won't be running against incumbent David Trone, so I guess... As you're asking people for a vote and your support, it's fair to ask the question, how will this time be different than last time? Good morning, Larry. Good morning, Julie. You know, this is a real opportunity for the people in this district to get a great uh, seat, to flip it from Democrat to Republican, to make sure we have real representation for the people of northern Montgomery County, for western Maryland. Uh, Things are very, very different this time. Uh, things are looking really, really good. I'm very encouraged by the race. We're out there um, making things happen. And I could tell you, I'm not just looking to become the Republican nominee. I mean, I could really care less who becomes the Republican nominee. I, I care about who becomes the next congressman. That's why I'm in this race, not just to win in May, but to win in November. When I looked at the field back in February, when I made the decision to run or not, uh, I looked at the field and I I really felt that if I didn't get in the race, that probably Dan Cox was going to win that primary. And I just didn't think that he would be the one that could take us to win this coming November. So looking at that, looking at a poll, talking to a lot of people, we jumped in this race. We've invested, as you've mentioned, we've invested a lot to win this seat. Uh, I worked with Judicial Watch. We sued the state of Maryland. We won. As a result, this seat is extremely competitive. As you know, you're seeing 14 Democrats six Republicans on the ballot, and this is our opportunity this year to win in November. Well, you know, I, I, I'd i be interested in what you are hearing are the main issues for Marylanders, um, but I also would love to hear how you plan on responding to women. Um, Democrats are telling women that uh, Republicans not only want to take away abortion rights, but they also want to take away uh, uh access to to birth control um you know the, these are in the, the, many of these charges are lies but i i'd, I'd like to get how, how a sense of how you plan to respond to this because a lot of republicans have decided to just run away from this issue and i i think that that's a mistake how how do you plan to respond to that well you are right i mean the birth control that's certainly just a, an all-out lie i think we need to respond with truth and what's actually going to happen I think Nikki Haley did a good job when she was running, just describing that, you know, whatever your position is on abortion, the fact is, really, in D.C., not much is going to change because you have to get 60 votes in the U.S. Senate in order to make a change on that issue. You know, when I go to D.C., my focus is going to be on the first part of your question. What do people care about in western Maryland, northern Montgomery County? I'm going to concentrate on those issues. Now, with the issue of abortion, that is on the ballot this year. So, you know, with the new decision, the Dobbs decision, that decision is going back to the states, and Maryland has it on their ballot this year, whether they're going to have abortion guaranteed in the Maryland state constitution or not. I think that's a huge mistake. I'm going to vote against mm. that amendment, uh, and I, I'm going to make sure to say that all the way till mm-hmm. November. There's, there's a couple of good websites people can go to for information. Uh, but look, it's a state issue at this point, and that shouldn't be affecting people's decision for Congress. Well, I- Okay, but to be fair, uh, there there may be a push amongst either Republicans or Democrats to make a federal law. Yeah. Uh, and President Trump has suggested that a 15 week ban might be the way to go if there is going to be a federal law. I mean, it might you might face it if you become a congressman for your next two years to have to vote up or down on a federal law. Will your position be no? I don't think there should be a federal law. This should just be a state issue. Well, I think it doesn't. 
I mean, honestly, I'm going to vote on that issue. Um, but it doesn't matter what the vote's going to be, or even what President Trump wants, because he won't have 60 votes in the U.S. Senate. He won't get it passed. So, so the reality is, we can focus on issues uh, that the vast majority, 80 percent issues that people yeah. in Western Maryland and North Montgomery County uh, care about, and those are the issues I'm going to be focused on as I'm running for Congress this right. year. You might want to also just to, listen. I'm the last person to give advice to a politician. You guys are in a totally different league, but you might also, if asked, post uh, post the question posed to you. You might want to say, I'll tell you what, you know, as soon as my Democrat opponent explains what limitation they would put on abortion, then we can have a conversation. But I, I'm certainly not going to just uh, sit here and, and just debate amongst myself and yeah. other Republicans about what limitations we would put on when Democrats don't want to put any limitations. Yeah, and, and I do think that women, <laughs> when they hear how extreme, and many of them don't know how extreme the Democrats are, but when they hear that, you know, the Democrats are pretty much like, you know, up until birth, up yeah. until the woman goes into labor, we can have an abortion. You know, you, we want to allow women to have an abortion. That's insane. And I think that is a that, that is a winning strategy. Yeah. Just say, listen, you may not like what uh, limitation I put on it, whether it's 15 weeks or 20 weeks. But uh, the fact is, my opponent would have no limitations yeah. on abortion. That that seems kind of kind of rough. No, I agree with both of you. Uh, that that is a huge problem that the Democrats have the vast 80 percent. Most Americans don't want to have abortion right up until nine months. Right. I was actually on NPR yesterday afternoon. I'm sorry. And no. I got pushback. <laughs> I, right. I know. <laughs> but um, they they talked about abortion and I, I pushed back and said, you know, in Maryland, you can have abortions up until nine months, right Good. up until birth. And Leroy Carhart moved his practice in 1991 here to Maryland on purpose to have late-term abortions. Yeah. And they pushed back and said, oh, there are no nine-month nine abortions. That doesn't happen. I'm like, are you kidding? Yeah, right. It's a lie. And Leroy Card, that's why he's here. All they've got They're is totally lies. lying. But... All they've got Good is for lies. You. In fact, the last ad I saw, I, I believe in, in uh, the last ad I saw said that third trimester abortions in America was upwards to 10,000, mm. third, third trimester. So that's, wow. that's just a lie. Uh, I'll confirm that. Pretty sure that's what I said. Real fast, Neil Parrott. Uh, again, the website, by the way, is Neil Parrott with two T's dot org. Neil Parrott, two T's dot org. If you want more information about him and to support his campaign for the sixth district, you mentioned I, I rarely do this, but since you mentioned Dan Cox uh, directly, I just want to just be clear here uh, because this sort of came up in the Republican nomination for governor two years ago when Dan Cox was running. People thought that he couldn't win. You just said you don't think he can win. That said, should he get the nomination, you will support him in the general, right? Oh yes. Uh, okay. However, because Larry Hogan I, wouldn't I go there, the you know the the Republicans who opposed him for the nomination in twenty two wouldn't even suggest that. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Well, that's part of the real problem, Larry. What you just hit on, though, um, if he were to win this nomination, uh, Larry Hogan, if he were to win for the U.S. Senate seat, they would battle each other. All the way to November. Look, this is not a winning strategy. Dan's already, Dan Cox's already battling Larry Hogan right now. There's no reason for that. We need to unify, come together. We need to win seats. We need to give Donald Trump as many senatorial seats as he can get, as many House seats as he can get so we can go in on day one and make a difference. That's one thing about my campaign. I've been a delegate for 12 years. I have a, I'm the proven common sense conservative. I've got the highest conservative rating. You compare me to Dan. I'm more conservative than he is on my votes. I've got the highest pro-business rating. I, I've got the, of course, he, he has been there for four years. When you look even at the economy and who's voting for making sure that we don't raise taxes, that we don't raise fees, that we don't spend too much, three out of the four years that Dan was there, he voted for the capital budget. That's the loan budget, a huge amount of money. I voted against all four of those. Uh, if you want the real conservative who's been there for a long time, there's really no question that I'm the one that would do that, and I would represent people well. I get along with other people. I'm an engineer. I like to have solutions to problems yeah. uh, and get but, things done. By the way, to that end, if I could just put a quick pause on our political conversation and, and keep you for just 30 seconds more, because you're an engineer also who happens to have an yeah. expertise in traffic and traffic right. flow. How we? What What are you thinking about the Francis Scott Key Bridge here, and what kind of solutions? Obviously, it's going to take a long time for that bridge to be built. Is there any other solution, temporarily even, that could be uh, employed there to get traffic back to some semblance of not horrible? Well, you're right. That is my specialty. My company is Traffic Solutions Incorporated, and the answer really is. 
thankfully, it's a horrific, I mean, horrific. We all saw that, those videos. Yeah. It's horrible what happened. Um, but when we look at the volumes going through uh, Baltimore, you've got the two tunnels and you have the Francis Scott Key Bridge, and, of course, you've got the Beltway. Um, on the tunnel, France, the Fort McHenry Tunnel is 100, 120,000 vehicles per day. When we look at the Beltway, we're talking 180,000 vehicles per day. Even the Harbor Tunnel is 75,000 vehicles per day. But that Francis Scott Key Bridge was only 35,000 vehicles per day. So mm. as far as impacting the other three ways through Baltimore, that's not, thankfully it, it doesn't have that much traffic. But what's really inconvenient are people who live there. Mm. Now some of them are going to have a very much longer commute. It's very inconvenient, and especially a lot of trucks that would have used that. Right, um, right. especially right. ones carting uh, hazardous that. materials. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it right. is an they issue. Can't just Tunnel. But you're right. I mean, I think as as a as a as a frequent uh, not commuter, but as someone who would often drive in that direction, the Francis Scott Key Bridge usually was the last alternative of the of the three that you had to traverse that route. Uh, Neil Parrott, we got to leave it there. Thanks for your expertise there, and thank you for discussing your campaign for the Republican nomination for Congress. Again, it's neilparrott.org with two T's. Neil Parrott, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Julie. It is 718. We want a little look. WMAL. Making sense of the news. Live. Live from the Home Paramount Pest Control Studios. Home Paramount, the leader in pest control since 1939. Upgrade to a new walk-in shower from Long Baths. Call now to get your free estimate today. For all your glass, mirror, and shower door needs, visit DullesGlass.com. Dulles Glass. Love your glass. WMAL's Free Speech Forum is back Sunday, June 2nd at the Birchmere. Details online now at WMAL.com slash Free Speech Forum. Literally just walking, and a man came up and punched me in the face. Stories from New York City women going viral on TikTok. I literally just got punched by some man on the sidewalk. Yeah, we uh, told you this story last week about this, uh, well, it's a horrific horrific situation in New York where women, single women walking down the street will just randomly get punched in yeah. the face and it's all captured on video and then the videos are posted on TikTok. Yeah. Uh, it's gross. Yeah, it's and disgusting. Eric Adams is saying that this is the corrosiveness of You're going to hear TikTok. Eric Adams say yeah. it right now, actually, mm. as I was setting this up, Julie. I'm sorry. The no, mayor okay. of New York was asked yesterday on Good Morning America about this phenomenon. I like my, my version. He knows Better. exactly who's to blame. Let's talk about these, you know, accusations and allegations that women have been punched across the city, uh, several places across the city, claim it on TikTok, and now there have been, what, two arrests? Yes, yes, it, uh, despicable. Uh, you know, they better hope that I'm not out on the street uh. when I see that takes place. Uh, it's unbelievable that you see the corrosiveness of TikTok. <laughs> okay, okay, that is... That makes me so mad. I love how he's like, you know, I better not be there. Yeah, yeah. You know, Tough guy. how about we allow women to protect themselves? Why don't you lift some of the restrictions on on carrying a firearm? Thank okay. You. Or hey, here's another idea. You know, you can carry mace in New York City, but you can't buy it online. And because of your, you have to buy it in person. And because of the restrictions on selling mace in the city, it's only sold at a couple locations. And so very hey, expensive. Eric. Yeah. Hey, Eric. We know you can't be everywhere to save us why don't you allow women to protect themselves there's an idea eric yeah and by the way while you're at it why don't you put some pressure on the prosecutors in that town yeah, and to actually uh, put these people, in jail. people uh, behind bars and maybe uh free up the yes. law enforcement yes. you arrested. keep saying that you're a big supporter of law enforcement because you used to be a cop how about you let cops actually arrest people okay and yeah check people fine but uh, spare me your dirty hairy kind of you yeah. know oh, if, if i'm there but the real yeah. problem is TikTok. She, he said, you know, if we if we just get rid of TikTok, yeah. Yeah. then look, we'll solve the problem. And I'm not denying that that is a problem, but this whole yeah, thing, and I love, and, but you're right. You're absolutely right about that. You know, Mayor Adams, usually mayors have people who arrest people. You don't have to do it yourself, right? He's like, ah, oh, I better not be there. No, yeah. no, no. How about cops? Oh, and when Eric Adams does walk the streets of New York, he's surrounded by cops. By security. Who were there to protect With him. With guns. From people. To try punching Eric Adams in the face. It ain't yeah. going to happen. Right. 722. Making sense of your world. I don't know where to begin. News Talk 105.9 WMAL. Thanks for taking my call. Making sense of the news. Just fast. 736 as we charge along here on this Wednesday morning in your nation's capital. Thanks for tuning in. Coming up at 8 835, excuse me, Chuck Thies. He's a political analyst for all things D.C. politics and government. We're going to get his reaction to Mayor Bowser's recent comments about how ah, crime is crime is fine now. I've seen the statistics. 
You may not be feeling it. You may be terrified on your street. You may be hearing gunfire. But I've seen the statistics. Crime's great. All right, that's basically what she said. I uh, yeah, that is. Paraphrased a bit. Chuck Thies joins us there at 835. But we go from the uh, from the ridiculous to the even more ridiculous with uh, Secretary Pete Buttigieg, who is your Secretary of Transportation. Of course, his uh, background and his experience leading up to that position in the Biden administration was that he was the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, which is not the largest city in Indiana, nor the second largest, not even the third, the fourth largest, mm. fourth largest city in the entire Hoosier state of Indiana. And of course, their entire traffic infrastructure under the guidance and control of the mayor had to do with making sure that potholes were taken care of, which I'm told, lights were working. I'm told he wasn't even very good at that. <laughs> But he's now your Secretary of Transportation, and of course, he hasn't been focusing much of his energy on our transportation infrastructure as it exists. No, his main focus has been to recreate, reinvent, and reinvest in a brand new fantasy traffic infrastructure that really revolves around you powering your vehicle with a giant solar panel or well, something like that. Also, don't forget, he focuses on how bridges and roads are racist. But oh, yes, yes, I forgot about forget that. that. And important. taking a lot of paternity leave That's for right. his newborn baby mm-hmm. that neither Is he, he still on paternity leave? nor his husband actually bore or gave birth to. Right. Okay, so that said, Pete Buttigieg yesterday talking about the fact that there's a whole lot of money and a whole lot of push for electric vehicles, except you're, right now, every single electric vehicle in America, except maybe the Tesla uh, is seeing horrible, horrible sales numbers, despite all of the incentives, despite all of the push, despite all of the propaganda. And Pete Buttigieg says, well, the problem is you, you redneck Neanderthal. (laughs) Tesla sales fell 8.5 percent the first quarter of this year. Ford this week is laying off two thirds of its workforce at the F-150 electric lightning plant. It's also scaling back a battery production facility because of sagging sales. EV sales are nowhere near what this president wanted or expected, yet the administration continues to shove them down consumers' throats. Why? Well, let's be clear. Consumers have wanted and purchased more EVs every single year than the year before. And, uh, you know, Tesla is facing more competition as GM and Ford and Stellantis and other competitive players uh, start to make sure they get a piece of the EV market. Let's be clear that uh, the automotive. Se- let's be clear. Every time they say "let's be clear," always just. I want to be of, clear. Yeah, it's very but KJP. I, I would like to be clear, if I may. Uh, Ford and GM and these other companies did not, you know, fall over themselves because they wanted to get a piece of the market. Required. They were forced yes. to get into the yes. market. They were and incentivized, by the way, with a whole lot of big American tax dollars yep. that Tesla didn't actually it's get. It's the consumers who are not cooperating. Let here. me be clear. Tesla benefited somewhat yeah. from government, but not through a big handout, through right. a spending package. Tesla purchasers for a decade or so when they were the only game in town were able to get credits on their tax return if mm-hmm. they purchased a Tesla based on their income. But not what Ford and GM just That's got. Right. Trust right. me, they would have been fine, you know, focusing on the internal combustion engine for as long as it took. It wasn't marking conditions and the desire to get into that competitive market that brought you your your electric Ford Mustang or the electric Ford F-150 pickup, which has been a complete and total flop. Uh, but but we'll let Secretary Pete continue because it, despite the lie that he just perpetrated, he's now going to be rude and insulting. Mm-hmm. Sector is moving toward EVs, and we can't pretend otherwise. Sometimes when these debates happen, I feel like it's the early 2000s, and I'm talking to some people who uh, think that we can just have landline phones forever. Oh, there you go. That there is, go. he's just. If you're not if you're not buying an EV, it's just because you're a dead, stupid, ignorant boomer yeah. who's clinging yeah. on to the past. As our, our friend Phil Kirpin this said, great. He said, does does Pete think that the federal government banned landlines? Yeah. Did yeah. the federal government, uh, you know, put out huge tax dollar incentives for manu- manufacturers of cell phones and mobile phones? No, <laughs> it's not like there was a big government push to right. get everybody on right. an iPhone or on a BlackBerry right. or whatever. The market actually the mar- moved us in that <laughs> direction. Right. People wanted it. it. And also, by the way, also- when Pete goes to work 
in his big luxury office as a cabinet secretary at the Department of Transportation, I guarantee you that his desk has a landline on it. Also, I love just this idea of a cell phone gave you more freedom, whereas like to travel everywhere with your phone, Great whereas point. EVs, they have pointed out that it's really hard to go on a road trip, for instance. It actually keeps you close to home. So it's actually even worse yes. of an analogy. <laughs> it does not in any way track the freedom that was given to you. You with a cell phone. Yeah, it's actually the opposite. Yes. People wanted cell phones yes, because they, they wanted a- freedom. They wanted to be able to do whatever they wanted and go where they wanted yeah. and not worry about the phones and not worry. It was a, it was a convenient and thing. And again, I am not slamming EVs. I think there's a lot of great things about well, them. Well, you don't buy them for convenience. And you don't you buy don't- them <laughs> like so a, that a you cell can phone. then... You know, I'm going to go drive to California. No, like that's not the free- well, you, well, you can't. Don't make me defend electric know, vehicles, I but know. actually you always- could. It's just not a I, great analogy, I is what I'm saying. I take my America-made Tesla up to New York oh, all the time. Uh, now we're going to go into this defensive mode. I'm just saying it does not offer you the freedom that a cell phone did. It's not that, a good I, analogy. I will, I will again say what I say. You do not buy an electric vehicle because of the convenience right. factor in right. any way whatsoever. Although if you do have a home charger, it is pretty convenient. I, I mean, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't had to stop to get gas uh, for the last year. a lot year. of money to put a home charger in. That's true. Thank but then you. it pays off over a couple oh, of years. Oh, here we go. So. Oh, gosh. Can we just but again, I Pete? made the choice as a right. consumer right. and as a private citizen, right. not because Pete Buttigieg and forced you ma- me to. you were to. willing to make those trade-offs. Uh, uh, you right. know, you, you knew that there would be a trade-off. Of course. And you were willing to make it. And that's how the market works. That's how the market works. Let's be clear that uh, the automotive sector is moving toward EVs, and we can't pretend otherwise. Sometimes when these debates happen, I feel like it's the early 2000s, and I'm talking to some people who uh, think that we can just have landline phones forever. You Luddites. Smug, arrogant, obnoxious. You Luddites who are on the wrong side of history. People used to say, oh, he's so likable because he just reminds voters. He he reminds suburban women moms of the, you know, the their gay friend at the office (laughs) or their hairdresser's, you know, (laughs) more conservative husband or whatever. That you the more you listen to Pete Buttigieg and his smug smart ass obnoxious you, attitude you, I am repulsed by oh, him and it has nothing him. to the, the only thing he's got going for him is that he's gay. well I, I mean that's kind of cool actually. <laughs> and if you want to be even more repulsed check out his uh husband on Twitter oh, no, he's, who is he's a serious awful. problem yeah 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 that said you know good for you Pete <laughs> good for you I'm just happy you're happy it's 744. Making sense of your world. There are a lot of things that really tick me off. News Talk 105.9 WMAL. Making sense of the news. Terrifying images coming out of the island nation of Taiwan as they felt their strongest earthquake in 25 years. Now, the epicenter for this earthquake was in Hualien City, which is um, on the eastern coast of the island and a good amount of ways away from Taipei. However, they certainly felt this in Taipei as well. Of course, uh, yeah. Most of the images of destruction that we're seeing right now are near Hualien City, though, where the epicenter was just about 25 kilometers south of there. Mm. Um, the death toll, I currently, I believe, is up to nine. Over 900 have been injured. Uh, some of the uh, uh, deaths, however, are from a uh, a rock slide at a nat- natural park, a national park, where people were hiking, and oh. the earthquake caused a rock slide. Uh, so, you know, considering how strong this was and the kind of I mean, we're seeing buildings that have oh, toppled, leaned over, yeah, um, yeah. and and huge things, lots of injuries. But so far, the death toll is not and as and tsunami as warnings anything. for Japan, which is very and scary. the Philippines. Yeah, yeah, you get this kind of earthquake, and obviously, you end up getting this well, literally a ripple effect, but yeah. in a very large way with tsunamis. Yeah. I've been to, you've been to Taipei a few yes. times. I've been to Taipei a few times. Mm-hmm. It's a very modern city yes. and really well built. Um, Wonderful people. As soon as you get out of the city, it is very rural, Taiwan mm-hmm. is. And uh, I just want to, I mean, it, you can tell when you're in that city. You you know when you're in a foreign country and the building codes and the city codes aren't quite the same as what we're used to here in America. Where, yeah, let's just say I wouldn't want to be in a wheelchair. No, yeah, exactly. The sidewalks are not right. great. And you could like when they build a building, even in Taipei, which is, again, a very modern city, the sidewalks don't match, right. you know, one building and another. And it's, yeah. it's, it's sort of it's so and that's usually an indication that the city 
um, code is not really adhered to very much. Now, uh, listen, they know about earthquakes there, and so I think the earthquake code is pretty good, certainly in the city, but in other areas, I'm not surprised to see this kind of damage because I'm sure in some of the rural areas, the uh, the uh, Codes, yeah, the, the, the codes or yeah. the or the, the they're not necessarily up to the same level. Yeah, 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 I'm not surprised at all either. But it is um, uh, really scary. Fire authorities said about 60 of the roughly 77 people. There's apparently 77 people trapped were caught in a tunnel mm-hmm. just north of Hulan City, with two Germans among those trapped in another tunnel. Um, the government, again, put the number of injured at 736, so lots of injuries. Ugh. There have been more than 50 aftershocks that have been felt. I can mm-hmm. tell you that yeah. there are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of aftershocks that you might not even feel. Uh, what's the strongest earthquake you've ever been in? Oh, tiny in southern Illinois. I just, I barely felt it, but it was, I did feel it. Mm. Yeah, okay. but was, you, California oh, I was boy. In, I've been in the, the Northridge quake and, wow. and the Whittier Narrows quake. Oh, were both, wow. were pro, both pretty big ones there in the 90s that I mm. experienced. And uh, it's, well, I mean, the, the this is, so this is a 7.2 magnitude. I think the uh, the Northridge quake, which took down a couple of the freeway overpasses in oh, Southern California, right. oh. uh, that was a 7.1, if I remember right. I can still um, remember that. But it that. was right yeah. near the city. This one, again, I want to say is a good ways away. Um, but still, they're feeling it in Taipei. So, of course, everyone in the great nation, and you're right, great people of Incredible. Taiwan. Incredible. Just they wonderful. love America. They, they love their freedom. They have a very American culture, too. Mm-hmm. And uh, they are, of course, in our prayers. And hopefully they will get through this without much. Oftentimes with an earthquake, when you've got damages in buildings like this, the real danger is now. Yeah. When you start doing the cleanup and then yeah. things start falling that you didn't realize were as precarious as they looked. That's and right. So they're not out of danger yet. 753.